I had this cool acrylic license plate cover, custom laser engraved to match my vehicle's license plate number, which you now know, and then I spliced in an ESP32 microcontroller and wrote some code to generate the visuals. It can do solid color fills as well as more complicated effects like this flame effect. It can also do complex color wipes and fades. Today I'll show you the science behind how the lighting works, how I modified it, and we'll consider the important question of whether this is all even legal right here today in Dave's Garage. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Today in Dave's Garage, we're going to learn about linear fiber optics, total internal reflection, the ESP32 microcontroller, and more as we dive deep into both the theory and practice of how this cool license plate frame is constructed and works. Then we'll consider whether such a thing is even legal on the street. Now I first saw these plate frames at my local mail center where someone from the town was selling them and they'd posted an order form. I took a photo of the form and sent off an email to find out what they needed from me in order to produce one which turned out to be a high-res scan of my actual license plate so that they could precisely align the outline lettering. The only problem was that my home scanner is made for your typical 8.5 by 11 inch paper, so it's not quite large enough to scan an entire license plate. So I took my plate back to the mail and print center where it all started, and they scanned my plate in for me at full size. Then it was just a case of waiting a few weeks until my package arrived. The company offers them in solid white and in RGB multicolor, and because I love to tinker with individually addressable LEDs, I ordered the RGB version in the hopes that I'd be able to hack the LED signal and connect my own custom controller. When the package arrived, I first connected it up on the bench as supplied to confirm that everything worked out of the box, which it did. But it only had a single color wipe effect, and while the effect was reasonably cool, it's not something I wanted to display on my plate at all times. Most of the time, I would want it simply illuminated with a white outline. I could have ordered just the white one, but what fun would that be? I wanted it all, with all the features, and so it was time to do some soldering. To make that either color or white happen on demand, I'd need to connect my own controller and write my own effects software. And in fact, since I've been working on an open source LED code base called NightDriverLED.com for a couple of years now, what I really needed to do was to adapt the NightDriver code to whatever LED technology was being used in the plate frame. So I wrote to the vendor who manufactured the frame to inquire as to what LEDs were actually being used inside the frame. If I was lucky, they would be the super common WS2812B style, also known as NeoPixel, which is widely supported. Since Nightdriver already handles those, it would be pretty easy to adapt if that were the case. But for both better and worse, they were not the more common standard, but a style known as SK6812. Normally, in a conventional LED strip, each LED location is actually made up of three LED elements a red, a green, and a blue that you can selectively combine in various brightnesses to make whatever color you wish, or even white. The SK6812, though, adds a fourth LED element to each location, but in pure white. While you can, as I said, combine the red, green, and blue LEDs of a regular strip to make a white light of sorts, it's not very bright, it's not very efficient, and it's not the most pleasing color of white. So having a dedicated white LED is a nice addition to any strip. The problem is that behind the scenes, Nightdriver relies on a software package called FastLED to manage the LED communication, and FastLED did not have SK6812 support until very recently. The new support for them was still actually experimental, so I had to enable it by defining a few compiler values. Whereas normally, each LED gets sent 8 bits of red, 8 bits of green, and 8 bits of blue, an RGBW strip adds another byte for the white LED. One of the oddities is that in your fast LED code, you still claim to be using WS2812 strips, but once you've called the set RGBW function on the strip, it will know that it has to send the extra byte of data for each LED, which is ultimately what it comes down to. So to show you how I connected my ESP32 module to the plate frame, I need to explain the basic wiring setup for individually addressable LEDs, and thankfully, it's painfully simple. There's just a 5 volt power wire, normally red, a ground, normally black, and then a single data wire, normally green or blue. That data wire gets connected to one of the GPIO pins on the ESP32, and then we tell FastLED which pin we're using, and the rest is largely automatic. To make the physical connection, I had to cut the cable coming out of the plate frame, which was a little scary. This is the three-wire connection with power, ground, and data. Thankfully, the wires turned out to be red, black, and blue, which makes it pretty easy to sort out what was what. So I spliced in a dedicated 5 volt power supply because even though there are only a total of about 40 LEDs in the plate frame, if you set them to bright values, they're still going to draw a lot more power than the ESP32 can supply from its little internal regulator in the module. For anything more than just a small handful of LEDs, a separate power supply is essential. 
For installation in a car, which is nominally 12 volts, you need a 12 volt to 5 volt buck converter, a simple little module like this. You simply connect the input of your 12 volt circuit and it produces a constant 5 volts that you need. And while all of these LEDs operate on a 5 volt system, the ESP32 itself is actually a 3.3 volt chip. So that means when it tries to command a data signal on the data line, it'll only be sending at most a 3.3 volt signal. And the value for high or on is actually 3.4 volts according to the LED's data sheet. So by that reckoning, it shouldn't work at all. But the reality is it does, and I've never seen a strip that actually required a level shifter to step the signal up to 5 volts. It would be technically correct to use one, and it's the right way to do it, but so far, I've never found it necessary. Your mileage may vary, but mine never has. For an ESP32 module, I'm using the M5 Stick C+. In addition to the ESP32 chip itself, it includes an attractive little color display, buttons, a microphone, IMU, IR transmitter, and a lot more. You can pick them up for around 20 bucks, and they're incredibly versatile. And like all the parts I use in this build, links can be found in the video description. There's a small connector known as a four pin Grove connector and we'll need just two of its wires. We'll leave the power completely unconnected as we'll be powering the strip directly with its own five volts. But that does mean that the ground has to be connected and we need to connect our data line. So with just ground and data connected, we should have full control over the LED strip. Now I'm using platform IO to build this code. So in my source control file, I have defined the constants needed to enable the experimental RGBW support and I've added a new section for the plate cover project. To build this project then, all we need to do is to set the target to plate cover and select platform IO build. That will run for a moment and when it's done we can select upload to send our program to the ESP32 module. That will take about 30 seconds and when it's done our chip will reboot and start running. When it does we see our frame rendered in a nice white outline. This is using just the W portion of the LEDs, so it should give us a nice bright natural white. To change the effect, we simply press the big button on the M5 module and it will step through the various active effects that I've installed. The next one up is simply a pure red, followed by a pure amber color, and then finally a flame effect. The flame effect ignites sparks at the center of the plate which bloom outwards, slowly cooling as they do. After the flame effect comes a nice color wipe. Some of the nicest looks actually come from the darker colors to give the plate a nice high contrast background and bright letter outlines. And finally, we have a black color fill, which has the same effect as turning the LEDs off. When the LEDs are not illuminated, the plate cover, being effectively clear, turns invisible to the naked eye. That leaves us with two remaining questions. How does it actually work, and is it legal to run it on the street? Well, the magic behind this effect is a combination of physics and a clever use of light's properties within clear materials like acrylic. Imagine the clear cover as a light highway, like a fiber optic tube. Light from the LEDs hits the inner walls of the tube and because the acrylic has a higher refractive index, meaning it bends light more than air does, most of the light, almost all of it, doesn't escape. It just bounces around inside and thanks to internal total reflection, it stays in there. This principle is what keeps light trapped within the material, bouncing off the surfaces as it travels along the cover, almost like it's riding down an invisible tunnel. But now instead of just a tube, we have a full sheet of clear acrylic, meaning we have a top surface and a bottom surface, and the light is free to roam in 2D between these two layers, trapped by the angles of the total internal reflection. And here's where the etching comes into play. You see, when you etch the acrylic with a laser, you create tiny rough patches, essentially scattering points. These scattered points break up the smooth surface enough to allow the trapped light to escape, releasing it exactly where it's needed as diffuse light. The light then appears to spill out or glow from the etched lines. Without etching, the cover would look like just a clear sheet with LEDs on the edge, but with etching, you direct that internal light to specific areas like drawing in neon. It's a bit like graffiti with light. Etching dictates where the light escapes, turning an ordinary license plate cover into a unique illuminated display. Your clear cover is essentially a glowing canvas where the light itself is invisible until it meets those etched disruptions, transforming an invisible pathway into your striking illuminated design. Now, what about the legality? Well, first we have to keep three things in mind. One, the federal vehicle safety standards, two, state laws, and three, what the plate actually looks like. The federal standards control the basic responsibilities of the vehicle in terms of lighting, and they prohibit doing things like putting flashing blue lights on the back of your car. Red is reserved for braking, and in the United States, for crazy historical reasons, also turning. Amber is used for signal lights as well, and your license plate frame should be white light. Right from the get-go, then, it's pretty clear that none of these colored or flame effects are going to be acceptable on the public roadway. So we know that the only way we're going to be legal is to turn it into the pure white mode. But even then, is it legal? This is a question that's going to vary from state to state, and you'll have to do your own research and draw your own conclusions. And this is, of course, not legal advice, and I'm not an attorney. 
But here in Washington State, up until this summer at least, the law was pretty clear. Your plate cover could not obscure or change the plate number in any way. But in June of this year, the law was updated to read, plate covers are not permitted, with no actual criteria for what makes them illegal. They just are, even if clear. So in Washington State, whether it makes a lot of sense or not, even a clear, transparent cover is a violation. Thus, not legal in my state. As for me, I haven't decided what to do with that information. Discretion being the better part of valor, it's one of those things that I can still do in good conscience knowing that the plate cover does nothing to make the plate harder to read. By the intent of the law, I should be fine. But the letter of the law is such that there's no room for debating the finer points. Plate covers are illegal here, plain and simple. Thing is, I haven't had a ticket or an accident or even been pulled over in almost 40 years since I was like 17 years old. And so I don't really want to tempt fate by giving them a reason to pull me over. Maybe we'll just run it in the parking lot and at car shows. If you found today's little journey into optics and ESP32 is interesting at all, please remember that I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so I'd be honored if you consider subscribing to the channel and leaving a like on the video before you go today. And if you're already subscribed, thank you. Please be sure to turn on the bell notifications and the reminders. If you have any interest in matters related to the autism spectrum, please check out the free sample of my book on Amazon. It's everything I know about living a great life on the spectrum that I wish I'd known long ago. So in the meantime and in between time, hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.